practice is works like this because you're working with samatha and vipassana at the same time. You're getting yourself in a condition that is calm enough and the conditions are right for you to fall into a jhana. But when you're practicing the way we're doing it, it's a light jhana. We want it to be light to keep the mind open because we have to keep the awareness sharp because we have to keep it so that you can focally watch what's going on inside. This is what's different, okay? And so when a hindrance happens, you come out. So actually, when if I were to, um, if I were to show you a picture of this, um, when when we look at the person and we say when the person is is going into the jhana you're um hmm. i show people the picture like this this is the waterfall i'm showing you the picture where um this water comes the rain comes into the pond at the top of the mountain and then it comes over and you have these little things like this uh, whoops there's one and this is a pothole under a waterfall. So this waterfall is coming down, right? And then, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Two, three. We'll just go as far as the fourth jhana, just for this experiment. We go all the way, goes all the way down to where you fall off the end into cessation and come out and experience Nibbana. So when you fall into this, when you're practicing in the beginning, you're working. <laughs> towards practicing until the conditions are right where this gets full enough that it can you can fall into the first jhana okay now when you're in the jhana when you're when you're in here in the water okay and you're in the jhana you're in the jhana and if a hindrance happens and you move your attention to move over to the hindrance to see what it is you have left the jhana your 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 um mindfulness which is your observation and your energy has weakened and fallen down in your interest and when it slips you're not in there anymore so actually if i i don't know exactly how to show you but the um the hindrances are out here and it, for you to get involved in one means you have to leave here to go to them and then you're not in jhana anymore so our practice is uh, described in the text very well that the samatha and the vipassana are both happening evenly yoked together. What something that's evenly yoked together are like two bulls like this. Okay, these are the two bulls. Okay, and um, these bulls are pulling a cart, a, a big cart behind them like this. this they're pulling a cart. So when they have their, their yoke together, the yoke goes down to this and the harness goes like this over this bull and it goes like this over this bull, okay? You jump out to experience the hindrance and go back into the jhanas. You're going in and out. Now, as you it's a unique practice if we talk about it because we hear when they talk about an absorption jhana, and you get to jhana, they want you to stay there for six months to a year. Then they want you to go to the second house seat. So you may have, may have discovered that in five or 10 years to get to this one, you may get in there, but you can look at a long time. It'll be a shorter time because you did it one time, just like any of this, the next time it's easier. But they want you to stay in it and become totally, our approach is different. There's nothing in the text that says you should do it that way. That whole approach comes from something he was practicing before he was, his mind was liberated, before he was awakened. And it, pull, it came back on top of it after he was gone. And you have to understand, 99.9% .9 of the big teachers that are teaching today are teaching based on the Bible of meditation. And what is that? The Vasudhimaga. And what is the Vasudhimaga is very important to understand. The person who put that big book together, okay, that big book, it's not that he put it together or wrote it and he's an author and he's a meditator. He's, he's an intellectual and a poly scholar and was an academic. And his job wasn't to write a book about what the Buddha said or did or taught. His job was to pull together 225 commentaries, condense them and compile them into one book and say, this is what Buddhism was. 
And then uniquely, like some kind of movie script, uh, the library burned down and the 225 commentaries are gone. So none of us can look and see what they really said. But when he met something he didn't quite understand, he worked it out. And he worked it out in, in this way in the section, one third of the book is meditation. And when he figures something out, the problem is he was a Brahmin for longer than he was a Buddhist monk when he comes over to do the job. See the problem? He grew up as a Brahmin family practicing the old way. So when he has a question of meditation, that's where he goes. Because in his world, we, we predict this is all me just predicting what it is. Nobody really knows. But you're looking at somebody who has to, that's a question about, well, I practiced all those years with our family priest and, you know, in my village, and this is the way we did everything. So it must mean that. So when he solves a problem, that's how he solves it. Because why? Because he, the book was based on the commentaries. They decided along the way after the Buddha was gone, what we're teaching you, his exact words, was just for the people and for the farmer and just simple stories and stuff like that. And not really, uh, the, hot, the really good stuff is uh, coming from the Abhidhamma, which is fascinating because that didn't even get written until 300 years after the Buddha's gone. <laughs> you know, so if you, it's right now, university, you see the predicament we're in, you see? So when we come and we find this, where did this practice we're teaching you come from is very interesting, okay? In the Eightfold Path, but also in the, in the texts, the Majjhima Nikaya, the Samyutta Nikaya, the Digha Nikaya, and, and Gurdjie Nikaya, Right effort and right striving is very clearly four steps. Why do I say that? Well, because it's part of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And if we count them, there's four, 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 five, five, seven, eight. So there's four foundations of mindfulness, four, four spiritual powers, um, four steps of right effort. Got it? The four steps in right effort in the text in the suttas basically says, recognize when you have an unwholesome mind state in your mind. Step two, release the unwholesome mind state. Step three, bring up a wholesome mind state. Step four, keep that wholesome mind state going and make more wholesome mind states and keep going in the wholesome. The whole entire teaching is based on, let's see, I practiced before I was a Buddha, when I was a Bodhisattva, where he tells the monks, I practiced about the unwholesome life. I stayed over there a few weeks. It was, uh, uh, you know, okay. <laughs> I went over here. I practiced in the wholesome side much better. People want to work with me. Everybody gets along. Everything's working well. And we think that the, uh, that sutta is the, um, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, number, um, all right, is it number um, 19? And that sutta, is like listening to somebody talk about a high school science project for science fair. I'm gonna test what floats and what sinks. It's that defined. And, he, and you see, then this is echoed through the text. His whole teaching was about shifting over. So when he's talking about this practice, when you get all the pieces, they don't come in one spot. When you take those four steps of right effort, you add the relaxed step. Why? Why do we do that? Well, we tested it, but why did Bonte put it in there to begin with? Because the best recorded, preserved instructions for a meditation happen in the Anapanasati Sutta, um, that the instructions, and there's 16 dyads, okay, 16 two part pieces, make 16. And in there, there are steps that have to do on the in-breath, one tranquilizes the bodily formation, and the out-breath, one tranquilizes the bodily formation. On the in-breath, one tranquilizes the uh, mental formation. On the out-breath, one tranquilizes the mental formation. Those two pieces have been left out of training since before I was involved 20 years back. And back into the 70s and 60s, nobody ever heard of it because it's not in the Visuddhi Magha the same way. Now, when you read those, you have to have some information and understand some things about the teaching because it could get confusing when, uh, you know, when you read the steps. It sounds like you should be working hard, but 
you have to understand that there are variations to defining the words that are used in the translation. The translation we're using is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. The reason we use it and are devout to it, I might add, is because it's the working translation. If we go to someone else's translation, they change words in a different way than we, we don't, we change some words, but only as synonyms, get it? So if there's a word like uh, extirpate, and most people don't know what that means, I'm gonna say, pull it out by the root, see, instead. If I say applied and sustained thought, you don't know what I'm talking about. I can watch 30 people, they don't know what I'm talking about. Uh-huh, they're all sitting there, uh-huh, yeah, okay. But if I say thinking or examining thought, everybody goes, oh yeah, I know what that is. So we've spent years making the, the words easier for you to understand the steps. When we take you to the point where you fall into this um, first jhana, you still have experiences that you have to work through for the stability of your equanimity. When um, your jhana goes like, so we sort of looks like this, one, two, three, four. Now fourth jhana, what happens here is there's, there's four more pieces that go like this, and these are the mental states, okay, like that. And this one is infinite space, this one is infinite consciousness, this one's nothingness, and this one's neither perception nor non-perception, he wanted a big name, okay. And then it goes here, and then it falls off. When it falls off, it falls off into cessation. When, it come, when you turn back on, this is what we see the experience of Nibbana being. We see what happens, the mind opens in a particular way and certain things change for you physically and mentally. And we can ask you questions and if it fits, we can say, you probably did this. That's the way I treat it. Probably this is what this is. Now, whether as, you, know, you go through a mundane, a series of mundane Nibbanas before you go through a super mundane nibbana, which we've never seen anybody do since we've been doing this, okay? And we have, a lot of people have ideas about the arahatship being gone at this point in the development of Buddhism. But the Sotapanna Sakadagami and Anagami levels of attainments, the doors are still open and each one of the fruitions are possible for each one of those. So that six times you can experience a mundane nibbana where you go through and come out and make an attainment. So we've seen people happen and seen how the people change and follow them. So when you're looking at this here, you're in the first jhana in this water, like I said, while you're there to experience a hindrance, you go out of the, the jhana and then depending on what happens, you come back in again to your object of meditation. Here's your, your object of meditation and say here, right? And you come back in. And you work on this level until it gets full enough so that, um, so that it can go over and fall into the second job. And those have certain traits. When you come through a retreat, you get a training in 111 and the Anupada Sutta. And we take Sariputta's Sutta, the 111, as a very clear description of what we're doing, okay? The reason I showed you the, the, the two bulls pulling the cart is the problem with the idea that you would separate these two uh, at one point, it was hundreds of years ago, it got separated to, to jhana practice is samatha practice, okay? And over here we have vipassana. And of course the nature of human beings is, my God, my dog's bigger than your dog and mine's better than yours. <laughs> You know, so you have this thing going on between these two groups, and um, the, there, are, there are side effects for just doing this one, and there's side effects for just doing that one. That's why the Buddha, in, he came to, he figured out how he, he did what he did by going through to Nibbana. He changed something, and sometimes I teach that sutta, and you listen to it, you begin to, to learn about more about the, it has to do with the hindrances and he tells you all the things he tried and he tells the monks don't spend time doing that and uh he's warning you against trying to destroy them annihilate them eradicate them uh you know suffocate them suppress them subdue them and all that leave it alone 
just uh, release them, relinquish them, allow them, permit them, and they will just fade away. And he teaches you that what's wrong with the hindrances is they want to be fed. And when they come to visit you, the food they want is your attention. You make the hindrance bigger. You make it stronger and everything. This is how your, your jhanas are happening in your, um, how it's happening here. And then when you have a, a hindrance, you, people tend to go out and get involved in the hindrance, then come back. You shouldn't be getting involved in it at all. We can show you the suttas that say, absolutely do not ever engage anything that arises in your meditation. There is nothing that is important enough for you to leave your object of meditation. And that's what we, there's a, you know, we're in conflict with some people saying, go sit with them until they go away. The problem is they're never going to go away because you have announced you have oatmeal, eggs, and bacon for them. <laughs> you see, as soon as you're sitting there paying attention to them, you're feeding them. 